Hello, I am Antony Ivanov. I am software engineer at VMware and a technical lead of a new open source project in the data space, Versatile Data Kit. Um, uh, a little bit more myself, I live in, Bul in Bulgaria. I am a really huge believer of uh, uh, data-driven decisions and using data in our everyday lives and in prof professional lives. Uh, heavy watch. Okay. Heavy watch Moneyball. How many of you no, have read or watched Moneyball? Uh, yeah, it's a great movie for those who have not watched it. It's about this Oakland Athletics baseball team and their general manager, Billy Bean, uh, who is played by Brad Pitt in the movie. Uh, and uh, it focuses that the team has lost their stars and they have very low budget. So they used, the team uses analytical, evidence-based and data-driven approach to really assembling very competitive baseball team and, you know, succeeding. Uh, so in my opinion, really good decisions, uh, correct decisions are often one that we use data, data-driven decisions. Uh, so they usually trump pure, purely intuition-based decisions. There are still a lot of challenges in uh, making efficient use of data. Uh, and I'm gonna focus around those that are very similar to the one that have been solved in DevOps for software engineering. Uh, I have been working with VMware for the past eight years in the data analytics platform and that capacity will be able to work both data analysis, creating reports, uh, as an infrastructure operator operating clusters in Kubernetes, Kafka, and uh, I, this kind of different roles in the last two, three years. Have been, our focus has been how do we make efficient data engineering? How do we make it easy for data analysis, analytics engineers to be able to focus on SQL, modeling, creating bug dimensions, creating reports, ML models, and abstract away all, everything as much as possible. Uh, a quick sneak peek, so basically we want to go uh, from model where we have pragmatic infrastructure, silos and a lot of tension between, especially between improvs and data teams, uh, to a model where well, basically everybody can focus on work that they're really good at and they want to do. Uh, so uh, the agenda we first go over the challenges that uh, we want to solve. Why do we need DevOps for data? Next, we will focus on the DevOps for data as a service, basically what is the solution. And then we'll present three demos. Uh, it's quite possible we won't have time for all the three demos, so I'll let you vote for the, which one of the two last two demos you want, to, you want me to show. Um, so let's look at the challenges. Uh, let's uh, sort of introduce the uh, the two actors in our play. Uh, at one time, we'll talk about infrastructure and operations teams, and from the other side, uh, we'll talk about data teams. Those are the two personas we want to focus, because I know that definitions for personas can mean different things, so let's define them. Uh, for the operations teams, those are generally the people who provision the infrastructure, those are people who can know how best to provision Kubernetes, how to secure it, those are pe people who would provision and uh, Spark clusters, Kafka clusters, uh, Empower or Presto, or cloud resources like AWS, Redshift, and Kinesis. Uh, they understand the application of data infrastructure. For example, they know that using HDFS, it's better to use bigger files, not small files, while Kafka uh, accepts small messages. And uh, on the other side, also they understand how some dev best DevOps practices, like uh, how to be able to continuous integration, continuous deployment, how to make sure that code is version, traceable, and uh, so on. Overall, their goal is to maintain infrastructure and to make sure things work. Uh, that's, in other words, they optimize for reliability and reliability. On the other hand, we can ha we'll call data teams and I'm here using the terms very broadly. It could mean data scientists, uh, data engineers, analytics engineers, ML engineers, I don't know which terms are used. 
but they have the domain knowledge and the business knowledge to create the correct models uh, for their uh, business use case, to create the, they know the column names of the tables, they know how to best to join them, how to create, or they can create the uh, ML models to make recommendation systems and so on. Uh, their focus usually is on uh, making sure they can iterate very quickly to, in order to deliver to business. You know, businesses nowadays move very quickly, and uh, in order to be able to make good decisions, you need to keep the data with the same speed. So, for example, uh, if uh, we want to see if a new feature is adopted, we want to add a new column for this new feature in the table in a matter of hours and not weeks or months. But those two uh, priorities are sort of in conflict with each other. This is very similar how between development and operation the DevOps world, uh, where we want to, in the data team, we personally want to optimize for quickly delivering uh, the value of the data. But on the other hand, the infrastructure team wants to make sure that things are working. I do have a lot of situations where a data team would create uh, simply because they will use insert values to create a thousand insert value statements, which would cost huge uh, load on the database uh, instead of batching them. Uh, they, would all, they would, for example, store huge columns in a single in a single column, huge values in a single column. Uh, there's other problem is also that there, there may be often no clear separation between what each team needs to do. Uh, there are some times where data team does not, they need to provide their own infrastructure, so they need to go and start EC2 instances maybe, create ground jobs and what, all kinds of things. At the same time, if something is working in productions, we've had uh, operations team that has to sort of go and debug almost the data application, the data job that's breaking the production report. Uh, because you know the VP is shouting at them, and they need to make sure it works. And uh, this kind of borrowing and responsibilities overall cause uh, both for both teams to have much uh, worse dev operations and development efficiency. Uh, there is a very similar problem that can be solved sort of DevOps world. So we need to see how we can sort of adapt and adopt them due to some differences between DevOps. For in the software engineering and DevOps or, or data engineering. <coughs> so, we, if we can provide a solution uh, where multiple teams can work with data in a way that's easy for them to consume, and at the same time uh, for infrastructure operators to be able to efficiently operate it, that would largely alleviate those problems. What this means, so what we need to do for data teams, we need to have sort of enable them to create easy workload creations, like have self service capabilities so data teams can create end to end pipeline and all completely their own work. Uh, uh, in the same time, we want to abstract and sort of manage the infrastructure as, for, as much as for them. So when they go, they simply click create job or maybe deploy job or maybe they just do execute query and they don't need to co concern themselves if below that the files are in parquet, if uh, the code is version, and so on. And uh, overall, things should be fully automated, where the dev the, the, the cycle and whole data journey is automated for them, so they can focus on uh, business logic. In the same time, we need to enable IT to sort of establish policies, it may be government policies, it may be just best practices, and make sure those best policies are observed. Uh, for example, we can we can we ensure the data is anonymized? Uh, can we ensure that maybe all files that execute in the main environment are not executable? We and next we need to ensure that uh, sort of the infrastructure is controlled. That's probably the flip coin of managing infrastructure. Uh, for example, IT team best knows that in order to ingest data into Kafka, you need to keep payloads messages very small. So if you can provide some mechanism for the IT team to infrastructure operators team to basically encode these kind of rules, you know, so that when the data engineering team they are writing their jobs, they may be using interface and object for ingestion, 
and uh, in the same time, behind the scenes, those payloads will be chunked uh, automatically as part of the user code. So it can provide some kind of this kind of extensibility plugin mechanism so that IT team can provide these kind of features for their own data engineering organizations. Uh, that would sort of alleviate a lot of those problems because the, the infrastructure team which knows what are the best way to ingest data or the best way to query data, they can encode those rules and uh, what the data team can just was focus on sending data for ingestion or querying data. And that's what uh, sort of the first data data kit project aims to do, uh, solve those kind of needs uh, for the data engineers and for the infrastructure people and operators. So Versatile Data Kit contains two things, so two components. One is the Versatile Data Kit SDK. It's a Python-based application uh, which enables data engineers to write any SQL or Python, enable them to the interfaces to help them to ingest data and to uh, tr transform data. Uh, it has some goodies like clean engine quality, and importantly, it has Lego-like extensibility. Uh, so it enables exactly this to basically sit between the data pad and enable to uh, establish those kind of best practices. And the other part is a versatile data kit control service. It's a uh, runtime for data jobs. It provides an REST API which sort of uh, abstracts a lot of the DevOps cycle. Uh, for example, with automatic versioning and deployment, uh, it has monitoring and alerting capabilities, a lot of basic things. It, it's cloud native, so it's integrated with Kubernetes, and uh, you can have monitoring in Prometheus, and uh, it's a primarily infrastructure operations team. So it can, in, at high level, it, we need to do two things. At one, we need to sort of automate and strike the development process. Uh, so this is how we give power to operators to establish best dev practices. Uh, so what we can do is with style data kit, we can automate and abstract uh, if we flatten the DevOps cycle. We can automate and abstract large parts of it. So we can take care, for example, we, we, saw, we let data teams only plan and code, and they specify their code in some folder. And then we can take care, build all the necessary containers, install dependencies, that specify program requirements file, may run some tests, version it, and release it and deploy it, and behind this house happening sort of behind one single method, which we can call VDK deploy. In the same time, we can enable a uh, separate team to basically establish policies and make and extensions by plugging into the epoch cycle so they, they can, uh, pay so they can uh, control how the things are built, tested, and released. A very quick example, let's say that we want to create a de DevOps plugin which uh, will run some standard system test for all data jobs in the enterprise. Uh, so this is because Versatile Data Kit has concept of teams, it's most standard, so it, uh, every data job that's running managed by Versatile Data Kit would be able to, uh, uh, before it's deployed, would run those checks. So for example, let's say that we want to run some st standard system test, and at the same time we want to do security hardening in this example. Uh, what we are doing is we simply run some system tests that the, uh, some centralized team has come up and we remove execution privileges for files during build so that when the jobs are deployed to run in production, they will, they will not have any execution, they won't be able to be executed. This is an example taken from some use cases we had where we need to do some security hardening. Uh, and uh, this is basically a Docker image, which is, uh, can be configured during installation. And the second uh, important piece that we need to do is to automate and abstract the data journey. Uh, in a way, if you look at the data journey, which you know, you ingest data from data sources, you transform it, and eventually you use it to make insights. Uh, we should be able to make sure that uh, when accessing the database, there are some best practices that can be enforced. Uh, sort of VDK can act as, we can think it almost as virtualization layer. Uh, so we data teams can use 
the same interfaces, for example, dbRP for SQL connections in Python, and uh, on top on the, on top on the, at this virtualization layer, we can encode using plugins different rules, which we'll show in a couple of demos so that it's more understandable. So, uh, if we circle back, basically we can say that in a way the SDK, though it's primarily used by data teams, so they use it to develop data jobs and to uh, uh, basically uh, for them we this enables, them, enables us to abstract how to make their data journey, primarily abstract, and the same way we can the control service primarily deals with automate abstracting the DevOps cycle. Uh, so so it's uh, a bit more clear. Maybe we can show a quick two three demos. One, the first use case we'd like to tackle, explaining it sort of how do we install and deploy our style kit and how, what do we mean by the fragmented data infrastructure. So, uh, what we're going to do, so we are gonna, let's say we have multiple tools, multiple databases, you're gonna, we're gonna build custom SDK which is data engineering facing and we're gonna deploy it and have them use it and at the same time we have a runtime environment which they can deploy their data applications. Uh, so first, yeah, we'll build our custom SDK, then we'll store our style data kit using that custom SDK, and then we'll see how this is used by data teams. Uh, we'll start from scratch. Uh, so the SDK is simply a Python application. Uh, in uh, our case, if you use Python, you find this very uh, trivial. Uh, you can use, I'm using set of tools in this case, but we can use any kind of Python distribution package library. Uh, we just, here we Lego like, we mean we really can specify our dependencies. Not sure why it's so bored, but uh, we can specify our dependencies, like we specify here VD, VDK Postgres and we get some Snowflake, so let's say that our organization has dependencies to Postgres and Snowflake and we want to ingest data using HTTP and file. Uh, after w that, we can specify a configuration plugin, so in a way we don't have to, the data engineers which are using the SDK wouldn't need to worry about how, what are the best way to configure the, how to connect to the Postgres database. We can simply specify all the necessary configuration and I guess we will just leave user and password for them. And uh, in a way that it's a Lego, we simply let it as a new Lego piece to our uh, uh, dependencies, to basically the custom SDK that it want to build, which we've named my org VDK. Uh, now this custom SDK is ready, and uh, it's a Python application, so we can give it to. Uh, data engineers, data analysts, they can use it locally uh, to develop data jobs, but uh, eventually they want to deploy those data jobs to run in a managed environment, and that's what the Versatile Data Kit Control Service would provide. So le let's see how we can uh, ins install it. First thing we need to do, we our mark of VDK, we need to create a Docker image, because that's how it's configured, the control service now needs to use this SDK to run the data jobs with. Uh, we will probably target with version and release. Uh, and next, uh, we will use a Helm chart. Uh, the control service is start using Helm chart. And in this case, we simply specify the uh, Docker image we have just created. Uh, my work VDK. Uh, the tag is released. We use the same tag, similar to how we use the tag latest. This would allow us to automatically upgrade even if we have one million data jobs running. The next data job, when we change the SDK, the next data job automatically uses a new SDK. That's because the user code and the VDK code sort of coexist together. So we have two independent versions of our system libraries and for, for user code. This, uh, and then we simply run the Helm install command to uh, deploy our 
uh, control service. It will expose the race API, which can be used to deploy jobs, and we'll show what we can do with that race API now. Uh, for the race, so what we're gonna show, let's run one data job. We'll show an example of data engineer creating an ingestion data job. So what they'll do is uh, they'll get some data from a race API, which looks like this, and would uh, write some user code and start the key to execute it and automatically create the tables and, popu and uh, populate in the correct columns. Uh, that's a data engineering created feature for the Overstyle data kit. Uh, so our first step, we create our data job. We name it example and the team name, which allows us to group data jobs. Also, uh, we can uh, have some access control over which you have to be a member of the team to have access to the data job. Uh, after that, uh, let's say that we develop the data job. In this case, we will develop some ingest data job. Uh, the only thing, uh, entry point for all data jobs, for all Python uh, steps in a data job, are these certain methods, uh, which has iJob input, which is uh, basically interface that you can uh, use uh, some methods to uh, ingest data, to query data, the, uh, we can do separate talks about this. Uh, in this case, we ingest data into REST target table, and uh, we will ingest data from, it will look like this, basically from some JSON uh, API. I'm sorry about the board screen. And uh, let's say that we run our data job. Uh, first locally, and uh, after the data job succeeds, it e executed the ingestion and would have populated the uh, table. So we can see now that the, the row uh, is in the table. If somebody knows lati Latin, they can translate it. And uh, as the next steps, we will deploy this data job. Uh, so we basically, as far as data engineers concerned, they just click sort of VDK deploy command in the directory. Uh, and afterwards, we're still data to take care of everything. They don't know that there are containers behind it. They do not know uh, that we've stored it in some kind of version control, uh, that we version it and release it. This all happens behind the scenes. It's all hidden behind single VDK deploy command. Uh, and that is how we sort of now we already have uh, analytics platform. So we have a platform for data engineers that they can start using immediately. They can include in incorporate their existing data jobs uh, fairly easy. Or they can start using, uh, writing new data, data jobs uh, using custom SDK. We configured the databases so it's immediately connected to the existing data infrastructure. Uh, we showed this with a database example. And uh, we show how they can be sort of customized, in this case, by info operations team. In this case, we just simply show how we can uh, create configuration plugins so that the configuration is uh, ready available for in the when people are using the custom SDK. And uh, I'm not sure we have time for the all three demos, so I'll let you choose which one we want to start with. Uh, the first one sort of will show how you can improve data infrastructure security by automatically anonymizing sensitive data. Like we'll show how we can we can have a plugin which when installed will uh, the same data we saw there with configuration an anonymize some of the columns without any changes in the existing data engineering code. And the second demo would show how we can sort of improve uh, infrastructure stability by uh, uh, validating some beta SQL queries. Uh, we'll write the plugin itself because it's simple enough and uh, validate some use case for beta SQL queries. Uh, which one do you want to show first? So raise hands for those who want to see use case one first. Okay. And uh, can you raise hands if you want to see use case two first? Okay, there are more people for use case one. Uh, cool. So 
So let's start with uh, the yeah sensitive data, improved data infrastructure security. Uh, this is sort of an example of how we can automate or track the data journey and hide complexity the data infrastructure for data teams. So what we are going to do is uh, the same job that we showed in the demo, the first demo. We're going to install an anonymization plugin, and uh, it will auto automatically, uh, based on configuration, uh, anonymize the title field. But let's see. So let's first install the anonymization plugin. It's a POC plugin that uh, we I developed for the demo, but because it's currently I'm not going to show how it's developed, uh, we just install it. Uh, oh yeah, first we show that the data is not an anon anonymized. They like to sound out them. Does anybody knows what? In? I should have checked. I'm curious what it means. Uh, and then now we will install the anonymization plugin. Uh, installing plugins is simply pip install command. Uh, so we install vdk plc anonymize, and now we have this plugin uh, available in our own installation. Uh, but we don't want to just install it, we want to make sure that every single installation that's using custom SDK is using it. So we just add it as a new piece in our Lego structure, my org vdk. VDK POC anonymize. Uh, now, all local installation will be prompted after this is pushed to some PP repository. All local installation will prompt it to upgrade, and this, after we build, rebuild the Docker image, every single job that's running in the control service will start using the new plugin as well. So, let's configure it. In order to configure it, we need to first specify that we want to use a a preprocessed sequence called anonymize. That's how we named our plugin. And uh, next, we want to specify which fields we want to anonymize. Again, we do this in the configuration plugin we built in the first step. So once this is packaged in the MyAcubidk custom SDK, it will be used by every single data job deployed. And uh, when the data engineers upgrade the SDK locally, it will be used locally. In this case, we specify it's probably not seen well, but here we say this is a dictionary which say rest target table and is the key and a list of values, in this case one value called title. This is the column which will be uh, which will be anonymized. Afterwards uh, we now will show how this is gonna be used by a data team. So let's rerun our data job, the same data job we run again before, after installing the plugin. And uh, we can see that after querying the table, now the field is anonymized. You can play with the demo yourself. I will, you, uh, if you contact me, I can send you a link to where you can play with the demo by yourself. Uh, and uh, that sort of uh, showed our f second demo. It uh, showed how we can basically by installing simply a plugin and adding some configuration uh, without changing the existing data job. We can see it's the same one. Uh, our uh, data is starting to get an anonymized. This makes sure that some centralized team who wants to have control over this kind of decisions can make them in a central place. Uh, so yeah, we showed how we can sort of enforce this kind of data security policies for, uh, because it's applicable for all data jobs. Uh, you can do, yes, you can do uh, anonymization because you basically can intercept what happens over the data when it's suggested. You can do all kinds of things can figure out, you can start sending telemetry about the size of the data, you can simply reject it if you don't want it, and so on. Important things, there are really no changes on the data engineering code side. I guess we have time for the second demo. Uh, so, I'll do it as well. 
again, we will sort of show similar uh, concept how we can automate abstract the data journey. Uh, you have any of you had a situation where you have any of you operated databases like Postgre, Masker, Empower, Redshift, Snowflake? Like, do you have experience with this? You have had a situation where some customer user is doing something and all of a sudden the database is extremely slow or it's even crashing. And uh, we've had, there are a lot of cases where we had to deal with this kind of things. One particular case I'm using as Apple is from time to time, users were sort of decided to ingest data using insert value statement. And uh, those insert value statements tend to be, well, you can imagine if, if you want to ingest one million rows, they can be megabytes to gigabytes. And the way we use Impala, and the way database engines usually you have master nodes and you have worker nodes. Worker nodes may they have terabytes of memory, but the master nodes are much uh, smaller. Also, they are not optimized for needing to parse one gigabyte of query, so they will tend to crash. Uh, we uh, the only thing we could do initially was to we we'll simply would block the user and ask them to fix their query. Uh, but if you can do this much earlier, even during the development, the development cycle, that would be uh, much, much better. So what we next do, we sort of build VDK query validation plugin uh, so that uh, we can intercept query and decide if this query is too big or not. So let's build our plugin. Uh, first we'll build query plugin, then we'll re register this plugin in the control service, in the our custom SDK, so it's applicable for all data jobs. And finally, we'll see how it's used by data teams. So, uh, first we built our plugin. It's a all plugins in uh, SDK plugins, uh, Python applications. So, all we need to build is uh, uh, simple Python applications. It's a uh, VDK has multiple plugin hooks. They are simply methods. They are based on plugin. If any of you are familiar with PyTest, it's very similar. Uh, it's plugin is the same framework used by, by PyTest. Uh, so what we first did is we simply specify VDK configure hook and we say, hey, let's we want a configuration called max query size. Uh, this works, this basically be automatically injected from environment variables, configuration file, whatever, uh, depending on how it's the environment is configured. That's why I do it. In the next step, we will uh, basically just get the already populated value. And finally, we implement our database connection validate hook. Uh, it's the one that actually does it whole magic. It, it, uh, it's a special hook. Uh, there are different DB connection hooks, but this one is called before operation is executed, any kind of operation, usually SQL query. Uh, so what we do is simply calculate the size of the query. If the size of the, it's pretty simple, land operation plus parameters length, if bigger than the configured value, then we say no, not allowed. Uh, next step, we need to comp do, uh, register it as a plugin uh, in order to educate to uh, uh, realize that it's a plugin. The only extra thing necessary on top of what you do in normal Python applications is defining this entry point uh, called VDK plugin run, in which you specify the name of your plugin, VDK my plugin validation, and the package name, which is entry point for the plugin. Uh, after that, we uh, the next step is uh, after we've released the pipe repository, repository, we need to sort of edit our MyOrg VDK, our custom SDK that's used by our data engineers, data analysts in our organization uh, to apply this plugin. So we specify VDK My Validation, and we uh, after we deploy this, it will be used by everybody. And we can show now. Let's uh, in our example, I've pre-configured the max query length to be 10 characters, and uh, we can see that after the data job ex executed, the we have a query which uh, exceeded those 10 characters, so it failed. 
this is locally, so they get the feedback that the query is too long, long before they reach production and the database crashes. So yeah, in yeah, so summary what we did is uh, we created this query validation plugin which uh, intercepted queries and validated that they meet, uh, well in, our, in our case, some query length. In a way, we sort of simplify our operations by uh, providing better service for our users and at the same time ensuring stability uh, and this reduces dependencies between different teams. As a summary, uh, what we want to do with this DevOps for Data as a Service, we want to enable everyone to focus on work that require really their core skills. Uh, that could be different in different companies, so we need to allow them to decide what their core skills is for themselves. And uh, uh, in, in this way, uh, it maybe we can sort of allow infrastructure people to have control over the, how that infrastructure you use. Maybe DevOps people they can allow them to uh, implement some best DevOps CACD practices and allow data engineers, data analysts to focus on creating reports, creating business, transforma business logic transformations. There are a lot of more things. With this is a new open source policy, so our documentation is pretty poor. So I really suggest you contact us if you find anything interesting. Uh, you can find our contacts at uh, Versatile Data Kits uh, contacts. There is also maybe a blog with some articles uh, which you might find interesting. Medio.com.com slash Versatile Data Kit. Uh, Cool. Uh, so that was my presentation. I would really appreciate if you point your phones at this feedback form and uh, uh, complete it. It's basically ask your feedback about how about the pro about the project, about the presentation, and if you want to get involved. So feel free to reach out to us. Again, you can reach out to us to the GitHub page, you can start a discussion, open an issue, the Slack channel, uh, we are very open. And uh, 